Uh, hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, sorry about the little intermission. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Anita uh, Picat from the Sheffield Methods Institute, University of Sheffield. Uh, and she's gonna talk about uh, integrating reproducibility into the curriculum of an undergraduate social sciences degree. So it's something that is very close to my heart. So thank you very much, Anita. <laughs> Um, is my microphone still on? Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, just checking. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Anita Piekut from uh, University of Sheffield, where I work at the Sheffield Methods Institute. Um, and I'm really happy I was invited to share a little bit of my experience about my favorite module that I teach uh, at, here at the Institute um, in Sheffield. So I'm located um, in the England, UK, I don't know what everybody is aware where Sheffield might be. Uh, it's not very, I think, very big town. So it's a half a million city in England, northern part of England. Um, and today talk is about, you know, how to teach reproducible science, how to teach reproducibility and replicate, how to teach also students to replicate a paper within an undergrad social science degree, which it's really a big challenge because, you know, these are students who just started the university, might not have a lot of quantitative method skills. And although on the one hand, we, you know, there's been for many years a discussion about how a replication, you know, as a, as a tool to teach students uh, proper methods, is a wonderful, wonderful way to, to, to apply a wonderful thing to do in a classroom. Some even academics call it a gold standard that you know by following, you know more experienced, wiser people <laughs> already with who have all this um, baggage of um, of methodological knowledge and skills. Students, you know, following their steps can develop their own skills. So I think on the method side, many people would agree. And I'm sure no one here in the in our virtual space we are meeting today doesn't have to be convinced why this could be useful uh, to teach a replication or also why computational reproducibility. So a transparency, you know, when when you see a published research report paper, so you would know exactly how everything was manipulated, what kind of data uh, was used to analyze. To, to produce the analysis. And with the information available in this report, you're able to trace all the steps. So I think there is an agreement about, you know, these different pedagogical values of teaching reproducible social science, science in general. Um, although I would say that probably it's still much more common at the postgraduate post level, not really at the undergraduate level. Uh, so this is an interesting um, question for us trying to impl implement it in teaching, how we could do it so it still works for younger students, a little bit less experience, and sometimes, you know, maybe feeling that this is, would be such a daunting task that, oh, this is this wonderful paper published in an academic journal that I have sometimes maybe problem with understanding or reading when I read it. It's so dense and condensed with all this methods information, and you ask, um, a student quite often, which might be around 20 years old, okay, go ahead and try to recreate some of this stuff yourself. So this is a challenge and interesting question. Um, and then for me, it, it, it's a question, you know, how it could be done at the undergraduate level um, in a specific course, which is called quantitative social sciences, um, apologies for a typo, which I just noticed now on the slide. I'm sorry, uh, when I teach at the Shepherd Methods Institute, so I will introduce to you some of the things I do on the course, um, which I just call uh, this uh, course um, replication project and module. I know that in US, and I, I don't know about the Canadian context, that module is something different. In UK, module is like a, like a co one course, one semester course. I think module is something larger in US. So it could, I'm sorry if it's confusing for you, but it's one just a course. Um, that I just call uh, shortly replication project. Uh, and I will talk through some examples of what I do with students and then in return, what they, what kind of work uh, they produce for the assessment. I will finish with some reflections about what I think works well and what I think I could improve for future. Yes, already um, when we were waiting, we had a short chat about Shepard Methods Institute. It's a fairly new uh, 
um, so, social department um, in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Sheffield. And we uh, started, thanks to the funding we received from a program called CUSA program. So it was a special program which uh, was run by Nuffield Foundation in UK, uh, Economic Social Research Council now changed the name into UK RI, UK Research Institutes, and um, HEFSA is a higher education funding. So and in 2014, 15 universities in UK received this additional funding to create um, courses within social sciences that were more statistically driven as that so, so students would get better training quantitative skills. And this time we created um, two courses, um, two degrees, sorry, course degree, two degrees uh, BA in applied social sciences and bachelor of science BSc in quantitative social sciences. And quite recently, one more course, uh, which is called Pol politics, philosophy and economics. And there are also um, some other kinds of trainings that we provide in the institute. And well, basically, like in any departments, we have teaching and also academics do their own research. So it's fairly similar and standard. Uh, the quantitative social sciences degree, which I will refer to as QSS. So uh, this is the structure. Um, so within our institute, students receive plenty of different kinds of training mostly delivered in R, about our other software. Uh, so you can see how it's spread across levels, year one, year two, year three, and then in semesters. Uh, and then, so they do this methods courses in my, my institute. And because it's an interdisciplinary degree, they can go and select, mix a little bit of sociology with politics, with geography, urban studies, um, education, and so on. So they can, um, really select substantive um, topics depending on their, on their interests um, and um, uh, to specialize at the end in the main one. As you can see, in each of these levels, there was a similar structure that in the first semester student get some more specialized training about statistics, how to uh, visualize data in R, more advanced statistics in the second year, and then in the second semester, there's always a project. So in the first year, you have introductory project, in the second year, intermediate project, and in the third year, advanced project. So I was assigned to teach the middle one, and I thought, oh, this would be really boring for students if they had yet another, like, another project on the second year, and how to make it more exciting and interesting for them. So I came with this idea, wow, let's try maybe with the replication. It was, I think, already five years ago, maybe five, six years ago when I, when there were already some people teaching replication, but again, more at the postgraduate level. So I, I had a look at how some other people do it. Uh, not so many things uh, were there online available. So I've been designing the, the module across many years and I feel like now actually I'm sort of more happy how it looks like. And I guess it's always the case for everybody that you improve um, the module, the, the modules, the courses <laughs> across years. Yeah, so the course, as you see, is a second year module in a second semester. So before that students have already, I would say quite a lot of methods classes like introduction to statistics, how to visualize data, how to design a survey, and then more advanced statistics, which um, the more advanced in the second year is um, different kinds of regressions, multi-level modeling. This is the software MLWIN for multi-level modeling. So I would say they, they come in a good position to start my module. Um, and also because it's in every country, the format of the semester is also very different. Um, just to mention that one semester is usually 12 weeks of teaching and within just 12 weeks uh, you have another two weeks which you don't really teach students but you give them time for their individual work. Uh, so it leaves you only 10, work, 10 weeks to work with students I think for a short time to do such a big task as replicate, replicate you know, a scientific work on, on their own. And in the spring semester, there's also Easter break. So usually we have a few weeks before the Easter 
and then a few weeks after Easter. So it gives actually a little bit of extra time for students to catch up over the Easter break, uh, which is not the case in the first semester where everything finishes before is Christmas. Uh, and then on Mondays, I have a class uh, when I give a little bit of a lecturing, but because the class are quite small, it's always rather a sort of a tutorial or a seminar when I explain different things about, you know, how students can go about designing their own projects. And then on Thursday, Thursday mornings, nine in the morning, not a very good hour to teach, but <laughs> nine in the morning on Thursday, we have a two hour lab when I bring different things for them to practice, but also later in the semester, I expect them to bring their pieces of work so I can supervise them. Last year, it was really nice because I had a teaching assistant who was a little bit more proficient in art than I am, but this year um, it wasn't possible and um, to have a GTA for this course. So what's the task? The task for the module, the module, the course for the students, I think is a big task. So all the highlights indicate that, whoa, this is something really um, behind these words that uh, if, if you think about what the students are asked, it's really a proper, <clears throat> a proper large assessment. So students have to first identify a paper, like an article published in a good quality academic journal. So then you can think, okay, so what's that, a good quality journal? which employs advanced quantitative methods. And for them, this is basically just to indicate that it can't be just uh, descriptive statistics uh, or like some basic percentages or any kind of like too simple things to replicate, but it has to be some sort of a model, uh, linear regression, logistic regression or multi-level model. I think um, something probably also they can recognize that they could repeat in their work. And then uh, they have to figure out how to do an exact replication. So this is everything. The assessment is based on the secondary data. They don't have to collect the data again. Uh, I know in different, different disciplines, replication means different, uh, different maybe uh, has, has a different meaning. So in here, we just ask students, OK, find a paper which already is based on some sort of secondary data, like a survey, census data, some administrative data, or maybe if someone shared their data, it's also fine. Then run re exact replication just to see what are you could reproduce what they've done. Um, you could create a code from a scratch yourself. And last year, for the first time, a few students found a code and either you know worked with the code or improved the code or translated the code from Stata to R. Um, so I think it's also. Um, an indication that how the um, our environment is changing because a few years ago no one was students were not uh, couldn't find any papers that they could replicate with already a nice code to work with and now it's more common and then they also I asked them to do a, like a small extension um, and because I asked them to just select one model it sort of makes the task a little bit easier that, oh, it's not the whole paper you have to redo, but one model, but you can, you can argue that, well, one model actually is sometimes, it's already like the whole paper because uh, one model is the final more advanced model. So there are two pieces of assessment. Uh, one is after, they have to deliver after the Easter break. So they have a few weeks that they work with me. I, I also help them to identify the paper, uh, I basically show them what does it mean a good quality journal, so they avoid different kinds of predatory journals, how to do the search, different kinds of ways they can identify the paper, because actually starting with the paper is more difficult, so an easy way is to identify different databases and look for the bio biographies uh, for these databases, so for example, um, European Social Survey that quite often students use on a website, you have a list with all papers that were published using this data. So it's easier not to start with the paper, but start with the data and then find a paper which uses this data to make sure that you sort of have these two 
pieces necessary for the task. So start with the data, start with the websites of different surveys. <clears throat> and the first assessment um, still is in a form of a presentation because we used to have a presentation um, like a, at the student conference for the whole faculty uh, students, but now because the numbers are a little bit growing, it's not possible anymore. And to change any assessment, I have to apply for change a year in advance, so I haven't been able to do it yet, but um, yeah, it's quite, yeah, so I've applied this, um, this autumn to make some changes to the assessment. The presentation slides, I think, are still nice because students have to think about the paper as it was their own work and understand it very well to be able to tell the story, what's the was argued in this paper, what this is important, why it makes sense. So I think presentation was also um, a good idea to, to work with the paper of their choosing. Um, I think now I will change it into some sort of a report where they assess reproducibility of the paper and, um, and, and make uh, write some sort of assessment. Uh, so the first assessment is uh, about reproduce or like, you know, find a code and try to see whether replicating this paper is possible. And the second one is about doing this small extension. And there are also some um, guidelines that give them what could be changed. And what I think is nice that because we focus on one model, one argument is like, oh, just work on this one small question and think about what could be a sort of a counter argument or what could be done differently in case of this model? Or if you replicate this model for a different country for a different year, could you argue and why this could be give you a different result? So uh, I think it takes a little bit of a pressure that it's not the entire paper you have to replicate, but it's just this one argument that you work with. Um, and then you have a model uh, that you have to sort of understand very well across this for less, a little bit less than four months of the module. Yeah, so we use RStudio and I also give them different kinds of uh, exercises to work through. Um, I was hoping that maybe for this presentation, I could show you some, I don't know, some something more about the outcomes of students, but because the numbers are small and according to university ethics, I can't share any marks or even correlate marks with other marks because it's a, you can identify a cohort of students. It's not even about identifying a student, but identifying a cohort. So I, I think I can just present some reflections without really telling you exactly what, what are working on this project may be improved, how students perform later on at, for their dissertation. So, um, yeah, so maybe in the future, if the student cohort is larger, I can I can do some more um, sort of evaluation and assessment in a quantitative way of the course. Uh, but what I think is really good, uh, <laughs> what I like about the course, I provide them like every lab, I give them some templates to work with um, because although they had a plenty of modules, you know, there are still uh, second year students. Um, uh, who still learning in practicing R. So provide them plenty of modules on you know, how to organize their work in R and uh, refresh a little bit of what they've done in the first semester and give them a little bit more just to uh, strengthen, to build on the skills they have already. Uh, and the second thing, uh, which I think is good that we have different labs, let's say lab devoted to how to produce a good looking table, how to visualize data. And I already use, uh, I have a few papers that I showed them. Okay, so this is the paper. Um, all of them use European social data or some other survey I'm familiar with. Let's try to now recreate this table or this graph. And because this is more, still more basic statistics, it doesn't require a lot of transformation data modeling. I just show them that, you know, this is this paper which was published in this best maybe journals of sociology. And within this class, within the half an hour, we were able to recreate the table and this graph. So I think this is sort of also nice empowering exercises for them. So I showed them like bits and bobs from other papers, but the main template which we use is my paper published a few years ago. 
which is on attitudes to immigration and why people don't respond to some questions. So it's on non-response. And we sort of uh, shred my paper into pieces. Like first they, they have to criticize it and I tell them, okay, just be, it's also a nice lesson for students that, you know, to criticize, you know, you have to develop an argument in a nice way. It's not about, you know, saying negative things it's about, um, providing evidence why you feel like there would be another, there could be another argument make. So we work also for two, three, like three weeks with my paper, especially now in week three and now, now later in week four, then I show them a code, not entire code at the beginning, but like um, the code with some transformed variables that exercises how to transform other variables. And they, it's basically, a playground for them how to try different kinds of modeling and they can see whether they can find something different than what I've already found in a paper which is published. So I think this is also um, a good way to show students that, you know, this is a, a paper from your lecture. She published it in the best journal in migration studies. And this is, and if you find something different, it doesn't mean this is wrong, but you know, there is some reason why maybe you are finding a different results because the model specification has changed. I also showed them how to professionally present data using these functions like tab model, stargazer, coefficient plot. Yeah, so what I was already uh, repeating, I think, over previous slides, I think, you know, teaching reproducibility and the sort of taking, asking students to replicate one model, engaging with this one argument, it goes beyond this computational reproducibility skills, which we all appreciate about the methods, analytical thinking, and professional organization of data. But because this is focused on this one argument, they're also practicing writing like a, a good, well-argued uh, research um, reports. And this is not a little bit overwhelming. Like next year, they have a dissertation when they have to develop their a few research questions on their own. But now they're working only with this one argument and trying to polish it very well. Um, I have some examples of students' work, but I think if I share PDF, probably you can't see them. So maybe in, in the, I don't know, maybe later when you, um, when you, I think probably slides will be published somewhere, maybe you can access the links from the slides. So these are some examples of work from last year, which were really excellent. And uh, um, I think it's uh, probably a combination of things that I reflect in the next slides, but uh, I ask students to publish them on the R paps. So um, they're also aware that they have to create a present, uh, present the results in a, themselves in a transparent way. Um, and also in a way that, you know, potentially people who are authors of these papers, they can read it it's anonymized. They don't use their real names. They use student numbers to create RPOPs account. <laughs> so, um, so um, but it also shows them that now you're part of this community. You shared, you know, a replication. It's not the entire paper, but, you know, a model from a paper. So you're um, contributing to this collective effort, which is science that, you know, you, you showed that, you know, um, other people can read your work. These people who author of this paper can read your work. And some like the first paper was really amazing that someone wrote a paper about on the basis of British election study, uh, how um, social media users as a voters are different from the general, general population. And the student repeated it for another two rounds of the survey. And then also argued that uh, the Brexit vote variable could also be used to explain some differences. Um, um, and this paper had code in Stata, so a student translated code into R himself. The second paper um, had R code available on the open science framework. And the third paper, which also is wonderful, I don't know if anyone is interested in political, uh, in American politics, it's, I think one of the most famous papers <laughs> about differences between conservatives and liberals in the US. And actually the student found that it's, the main argument doesn't hold anymore uh, when you add more data after, especially after the economic crisis. 
Yeah, so I think in summary, I think it's possible because it's a special group of students who have a lot of training in quantitative methods in the first and second year before they start doing this replication. Probably it wouldn't be possible if it was any other kind of standard social science degree where you would have maybe one methods module in the first year and one method module in the second year, or even not that. So I don't think it would be possible. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying that maybe some aspect of this could be replicated more simple, asking students to reproduce some tables and graphs without going into regression models. Probably this could be implemented across other courses. And this is, um, as I said, a very um, engaged group of students because they choose this model because they like statistics, mathematics, or coding, or both um, altogether. So I think they just like playing in R. If I show them some things, they're able to go themselves online and find some more templates to, to work with. Uh, one thing which I think could be a little bit improved thinking about the whole condition of social sciences, it's like quite often we have these wonderful initiatives like UK, UK, um, UK Reproducibility um, Network, FORGE, which is Framework for Open um, Research Training, and then Project TIER that um, I'm a part of, which is also an initiative to improve teaching in a reproducible manner. We have like lots of these nice initiatives happening at the national or international level. And then plenty of people like us either interested in research and reproducibility or teaching and reproducibility. But I think like this middle, middle ground um, recognition of reproducibility in guidelines in different disciplines or in our departments, institutions, maybe is not so well developed. So this reflection also comes after our project here symposium, which happened uh, last year when we had different people for different mostly from US and uh, UK discussing uh, how they also teach reproducibility. It was our joint reflection. Yeah, so um, I hope there was something useful for people who, who would like to implement any of this uh, in their classroom. I'm happy to share a syllabus, or how we, yeah, syllabi, syllabi, syllabus or a bit more details because I don't have an, any public available website for for this uh, course. So um, I'm happy if anyone emails me to share a little bit more. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Anita. This was oh. uh, truly amazing. Uh, I have so many questions, but I, sh I should let other people, um, I should let other people go first. Uh, do, other, yeah. is, do, do other people have um, questions or comments? Uh, there's a few people. Um, are the slides around? Oh, like a link somewhere. Yeah, are they on your website? Um, I can share the Google Drive link, Google Slides. I don't know whether you have any space to um, we could just upload put it in the them chat for now, and then people could grab it if they. Okay. Yeah. So at the end, there is a list with. Uh, I'm just keeping track which papers uh, students tried to replicate, and last year group was a little bit larger. <laughs> um, that's why I have a GTA, and this year again, I think the student group is a bit smaller. But overall, probably in comparison to some experience of some other people, is a small class up to 15 people. Um, yeah, so um, you said you have a couple of questions. So maybe, I don't know, we can use one of your questions and then we can um, move on to, to the next thing. Uh, yeah, sure. Does, it, uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, they can just raise their hands and I'll call them. Uh, so there's a DM, so I'll, I'll just read out the DM. Uh, so do you have advice about convincing your department that uh, reproducibility and research methods are important enough to merit a course? Um, and was this a struggle that you had to fight? Yeah, uh, well, um, I think uh, in, because we are the methods people in, in our faculty, I'm still in a very good position to, <clears throat> to make any changes. Uh, but as always, it requires a lot of time to um, 
to introduce any change if you have like learning and teaching strategy, employability strategy, or some other department level documents. Uh, it takes time to develop them. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm happy now that my colleagues who are, you know, who teach also quantitative methods are very similarly minded to me. So they sort of teach reproducibility, but we have like bits and bobs across different courses. And it would be amazing to have something, I don't know what are you aware of the psychology department in Glasgow, that they sort of changed the whole curriculum around reproducibility and teaching, teaching transparent methods, and then designed like a whole a nice book online when for each class you have our, our books and you can see how everything is very well aligned with each other. Um, so I think um, in my department, it would take some conversation, but uh, um, it would be much easier to convince than in any other, other department, which maybe it's rather focused on teaching sociology and politics, not really teaching methods. Um, but um, yeah, it's just a question of time because then if you mention something like this, then I will be asked to write a 20-page document <laughs> to explain something, you know, how it would be, how it could be implemented across different courses. Um, yeah, I think the other question about disciplines, this is something more difficult because I tried to find different guidelines for uh, accreditation bodies in sociology, politics, etc. And they sort of, you know, they mentioned you know about um, research methods, but they they not of them in the UK. What I looked, they don't mention reproducibility at all. But it could be because it's still sort of fairly new in a sense that you know it's this change in the research par paradigm into open scholarship that happened. I don't know. It's happening, still happening over the last ten years, maybe. So probably uh, some of the disciplines need to catch up with the new way we think about the science. Uh, if anyone has any questions, yeah. please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, otherwise, I'll just start with mine. Uh, so how do you, what's your guidance? Uh, there must be more guidance than just pick a high quality journal um, because I've, I've really struggled with students picking bad papers. Um, mm. What's the guidance that you provide there and what are some of the struggles that they find? Yeah, so... Um... <clears throat> Well, I have a guidance, but also one of the first, I think the session you know, with, with Juan, when we talk about how to read a paper, how to find a paper, what is a good quality journal, I show them different databases, I show them what to look for, that um, these are the publishers like Sage, um, Taylor and Francis, Elsevier or something that you can rely, you can be sure that the journal is of a better quality, you can look at the impact factor. You can look whether it's registered in different scopus and other databases. And then if they're not sure, then just ask me. So I'm a little bit like <laughs> the final, the final person, the person to make the final decision um, if they don't know. Um, it, I think it happened a couple of times that students, although I, I tell them, you know, you have to um, get a confirmation from me whether this is a good paper for you to work with. There's always a couple of students who do work a little bit in the last minute. So I think a couple of people selected working papers without, without realizing that this is not a peer reviewed uh, piece of work yet. So um, yeah, so there's like a list of things they can check, but um, I'm, I'm, I think they do still need a little bit of a, a check and supervision with me. Uh, that, um, but this is a good exercise for them, like improving their literature search skills and uh, awareness if if they are interested in politics, education, uh, crime, etc. So they, they become more aware of what kind of um, journals are out there. So they build the skills for their dissertation as well. Uh, but this is a, a big task and I'm always every year amazed how students <laughs> manage to do it. <laughs> I don't know whether as a second year student I would be able to do it, but um, yeah. And I also don't expect them to submit like a perfect um, uh, perfect replication. I know that, you know, some, some of the papers sometimes they select maybe could be too complex. So I think the, the main assessment criteria is what are they also, how, how they assess the, the reproducibility of the paper and how they also prepare the research report so it's reproducible. Uh, 
Thank you for the guidance. Uh, I'll read out Ryan's uh, because last time I made Ryan mm. read it out and it turned out that he had screaming children. So then I felt very guilty. Um, so uh, Ryan asks uh, different social science disciplines often develop different norms or expectations around what's appropriate, for instance, logic compared with logistic regression, when to use survey weights, um, et cetera. It sounds like your program operates across the social sciences. Uh, do you find it challenging to guide people through diverse replications? And what are the lessons that you've learned that you can share with us? Yeah, yeah I'm just, um, I think one of the quite common challenge is that uh, some students, because some of our students, they do sort of management courses, they mix it with other disciplines. And then they try to find papers in different economics journals. And then they find something which is called fix effects models. <laughs> and they're like, oh, what's that? And why you have these observations in a country and you don't do multi-level models. So then this is, there is this interesting, <laughs> interesting conversations like, oh, because you know, in economics, this is a different way they do, uh, you know, the, uh, trying to explain fixed model and random fix effects, random effects. And it's interesting that for them, because they had a training in multi-level models, the random one seems more like proper one, not the fixed effect one. But I think the, it happens quite often with the economics uh, papers that they were a bit confused why things are done in this way. So there's like a space to talk about different disciplinary methodological silos. And also I think quite sometimes students struggle if they find papers or they attend them tell them to find a paper in social sciences, um, quite often they find something in psychology, probably because psychologists change a lot the way they publish data, uh, papers, they publish data and code. So they find quite often something which is already with the whole replication package. And then um, they also, um, it's a little bit more difficult for some of them to replicate. I, in general, I advise not to do it because there are some psychology specific methods that they didn't have in their course. Um, but if, yeah, but it happened, I think recently that a student decided to do it anyway, and then they couldn't interpret the model because there was some interactions with time because it was experiment with different, you know, um, like um, repeated over time and they couldn't understand how now you have interaction with time, what does it mean? So. Yeah, it opens probably some interesting conversations, but uh, I think that they, they themselves, because they have a training with a, within this interdisciplinary course, a methods one, not in their dis departments, they don't understand that these different disciplines quite often have different methods, but I think it opens an interesting probably conversation that it's not like one proper method you can use, but then, you know, different, different, um, different disciplines, different people will go for a different one, which, yeah, I know it's an obvious thing, but <laughs> yeah, uh, that we are afraid, uh, aware of. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, Ryan. Uh, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you or you can put it in the chat and I can read it out. Um, but I'd like to follow up on this data a bit. This is something I struggle with as well. So my students are mostly R and Python, um, and then I have them reproduce economics papers. So AEA, um, American Economic Association Journal papers. Um, and those are typically have stata code um, in terms of the ones that they're interested in. Uh, and so how do you how do you deal with that? I, I have huge problems because the students are like, oh, how do we translate from stata to R? And like, well, you just kind of have to look at the stata code and then um, and then <laughs> so, work it out. Um, but yeah, do you have tips? Well. <laughs> I, do, I do apologize. Sorry, La Lars corrects me that 70% of stata. Um, it's just the ones that I direct the students to. Um, yeah, so I'm a stata user myself more than R. So, uh, but uh, I think the couple of students that used it last time we found there's like a website for some basic things, uh, how to translate the code, but also if it's like a good script, it would have information, you know, this is what happening in this section. And probably it was a matter of a little bit of Googling and trying to figure out what was happening in both papers. So this student didn't struggle. I don't know, maybe it's because they also have SPSS and a little bit of SPSS code in first year. So they know that there are different languages for the same thing 
so maybe it, it helped them a little bit, yeah. But I also offered my help, I think, uh, as a CTA user, but uh, I think they found a page when they could translate pieces of code from R to SATA. Or at least understand what, what was happening. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, I think there's some a couple of similar presentations tomorrow because tomorrow it was originally my scheduled slot. Um, and oh, it sorry. Turns out I, I'm yeah, sorry. I probably I was there was a lot of having to move the timetable around with people. Having yeah. Questions. Sorry. So I, I made. Uh, yeah, made and they, sorry. I asked you to move my presentation, oh, and it turns out they they changed my class anyway. So I don't I don't have a presentation tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> a class tomorrow. So I could do tomorrow anyway, but. Um, it's always like this uh, with um, different kinds of commitments. Yeah. All right, so thank you everybody. I hope um, it was interesting uh, and probably will be useful to talk more with people who have similar experiences uh, um, like you, Rohan, Rohan, and then anyone in the audience, if they want to get in touch. <laughs>